Hello, everyone. Greetings to all of you, either in Ho Chi Minh City or wherever you are. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be with you. Um, I am in my office tonight simply because um, Natalie and Nathan, Natalie's my second daughter and her husband, Nathan, they, they dropped their three kids off with us. So we have Levi with us, who's seven, and Hudson's five, and Truman's three. So they're over spending the weekend with us, and it's just too much in my house to try and, you know, juggle everything. So I said, Jenny, I'm going to go over to the office and, uh, and do this tonight. So that's where I am now. Um, well, I, I, again, I'm blessed to be able to speak with you. I usually preach um, once or twice a month here in the States. Um, uh, last week, I was in the state of Idaho, so I was not speaking. But uh, the week before that, I was speaking at uh, my own uh, home church here in Gig Harbor, Har Harbor Life Church. And the week before that, it was at Fox Island Alliance Church. Um, so I do get to speak um, quite a bit. Um, in May, I had the privilege of teaching for two weeks online for Singapore Bible College in their School of Counseling, of which I'm a graduate of their master's program. And so I taught on the neuroscience of trauma. Neuroscience is one of my favorite topics. And I also talked about group counseling for addictions. And uh, so my, my uh, sphere of ministry is, you know, everything from church planting and pastoring and making disciples to neuroscience and counseling and lecturing. And so it's always amazing where God takes us. But, you know, one thing that's always the same is, uh, is God himself and the fact that we have friendships and relationships that hopefully are eternal. And so it's a joy just to be able to partner with uh, Lop and Hua and uh, so many of you, and uh, great to be with you. Well, I want to jump in tonight about talking about fathers on Father's Day. Um, I want to start with a, with a story, if, if I may. I want you to imagine the following um, situation or scenario. Let's imagine that I'm a property owner and that, that this is my property. And I have a neighbor and this is his property. And he has a dispute or a disagreement with me about my property line. And it's gone on for years. And let's imagine that he really doesn't like me. Let's say he even hates me. And he, he's always trying to attack me, but there's nothing really that he can do. Um, he hires lawyers, and he brings the case to court. And the judge agrees with me, and they say, listen, this is Eric Dooley's property. This is his property line. This is where the fence is. It's in the right place. And so, you know, to Eric's enemy, you don't have a case. Eric's right. Uh, there's nothing you can do against him legally. There's nothing you can do against him financially. You can't hurt him. Um, so it's over. And let's say that I'm also much bigger and stronger than my neighbor, so he can't beat me up or, you know, hit me or intimidate me. I'm safe and there's nothing he can do. But he is really upset and he hates me, and because he cannot directly attack me, he comes up with a plan, he comes up with a scheme, and he says, how can I hurt Eric Dooley the most? And one day it comes to him, I know what I'll do. I know that Eric has five kids, and he loves them dearly, and what I'm going to do is when the kids are out playing in the yard, I'm going to call him over to the fence and I'm going to say, hey, you know, I got something to tell you that your daddy told me. And he said not to tell you because he doesn't want you to feel bad. But he really doesn't like you. He doesn't love you. He just pretends to love you. You, the oldest. Yeah, 
you think you're good at athletics, but your dad's really embarrassed of you. And you, the second oldest, you think that you dance well, but you don't. And, and your dad says that he keeps giving you lessons, lessons, but it's a waste of money. And you, the, the next one, you know, your dad says that you're not very pretty and that your teeth aren't straight and he doesn't have much hope in you. And you, the fourth one, your dad says that you're getting in trouble all the time and he's really frustrated with you. And he's really mad at you and he's just trying to figure out how to discipline you. And uh, he really wants to punish you. And you, the fifth one, um, your dad said he, he kind of wishes you weren't his kid. Uh, you'll never be enough. And can you imagine? Well, it was a pretty good plan uh, because, yeah, that, that's the way to hurt me. You can't hurt me. You, you can't do anything against me. And so if you want to hurt me, hurt my kids. And the only thing that would really hurt my heart more than if I knew my neighbor was lying to my children and telling them those lies. The only thing that would hurt me more is if my children believed it. I believe in the same way that our father, this is, this is all his kingdom. And there is an enemy, the devil, and he hates God. That devil is powerless against God. God is always right. And in the right, God is always just and he has all power. He makes no mistakes. And there's really nothing that the devil can do to God directly. But he's a schemer. The devil is a liar. The devil is cruel and mean and vicious and heartless. And he's come up with this great scheme. And he says, I know I have no power to attack and harm the Almighty directly. But I know what I'll do. I'll lie to the children of God. I'll lie to all of those people and I'll say to them, hey, you know, you hear all this stuff about how much God loves you, how much God loves his children. He doesn't. You can never be enough. And God's really angry with you. He's frustrated with you. He's disappointed with you. He's ashamed of you. He really, really wishes that you would just get it together and act more like a good kid. And you don't. And he's so frustrated with you, disgusted, embarrassed, ashamed. He's just waiting to punish you. Yeah, he acts sometimes like he likes you, but it's all a show. He, he really... Um, he really thinks you're pathetic and you're worthless and, and you're hopeless and you're a waste of his time. And he has better things to do than to listen to you. And he's just so frustrated with you, so angry with you, so disgusted. Now, I believe that God, our father, the only thing that would hurt his heart more then the fact that we, his children, are being lied to that way is if we believe it. And I think that the entire you know, purpose of the devil, John 10.10, 10 says that Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. But the thief, the devil, comes to rob and to steal, to kill and destroy. And I believe that the devil wants to rob us of relationship with God and kill our hope and destroy our peace. He wants to destroy our relationship with God and with each other. And 
there's no way that the devil can directly harm God. He just can't. But he continues to use his time, which is limited, but the devil uses his time to lie to the sons and daughters of God and to constantly pick out things we've done wrong and say, see this, see this, see this. Yeah, God, you know, God tells me he's really frustrated with you. He's really angry with you. Well, the truth is this. If this is my property, there's my neighbor's property. He can't do anything. And so he tells my kids, hey, your dad said this, this, this. There's nothing that my neighbor can tell me about my kids that I don't already know. I know my kids aren't perfect. They don't have to be. They're my kids. I love them because they're my kids. My kids were small. We would put them to bed at night. I would take them one by one. I start with my daughter, Emily, and she's 35, almost 36 now. But when she was a little girl, we'd, I'd put her to bed at night and say, hey, Emily, do you know that daddy loves you? She'd say, yes. And I'd say, do you know why daddy loves you? And she'd say, yes, because I'm me. That's what I taught her to say. That's the, prop, the proper answer. And I'd say, yes, Emily, I love you just because you're you. It's not because you're smart. It's not because you're pretty. It's not because you're good at math or good at ballet. It's not even because you're obedient or love God. I love you just because you're you and I'll always love you. You might not always be smart and pretty and obedient and good at ballet. Uh, you're perfectly imperfect. And I love you just because you're you. So it doesn't matter what my neighbor would say to my kid. My kid could say, hey, my dad knows I'm not perfect, and he loves me, so I know you're a liar. I know my dad loves me, so I know you're a liar, so I'm not going to listen to you. And in the same way, of course God knows all of our shortcomings. Of course he knows our flaws and our imperfections and our mistakes and our sins. Of course he knows. And if he was that mad or disgusted or was going to punish us, he would have done it right when Adam and Eve sinned. Or he's had lots of opportunity to do that. But what God did instead is came to this earth as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because he knew that we were imperfect. He knew we were sinners, and he still wanted us, even in our brokenness, in our imperfection, in our messed up self. He still wanted us. He still saw us as valuable because we're made in his image. And so he purchased us. And so now when that, that voice comes, it says, you know, Eric, God's really frustrated with you. And he's really disappointed. And he's hurt. And he's angry. And he's, I say, you know what? I know I'm not perfect. And God knows I'm not perfect. But God loves me so much that he sent his only son that Eric, who believes in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life and abundant life. And that abundance of life is not possessions. The abundance of life is that I'm secure and safe in his love. And I know I'm accepted, that I'm perfectly imperfect. And so we see that Jesus himself in his humanity had this same relationship with his heavenly father. The only verse I'm going to look at, if you're taking notes, um, is from Matthew, the third chapter. And I'll just read 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. 
it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. God desires that each of us know something of his love through our earthly fathers. And again, the devil is a schemer who knows, well, if God wants these children to know something of his likeness through their own earthly fathers, the devil knows my job's easy. I have to break some kind of relationship between those fathers and the children so that the children really don't have an idea or a concept of what undeserved love is. And I believe that it's the plan of the devil to obscure, to mar, um, to break the, uh, that, that image of what a father is. And I always I make it a little bit of a joke about this to, to, to be a bit lighthearted. And I say this, God makes your children very resilient, mom and dad. He gave them great resiliency. He knew who their parents were going to be. And I also say the other way, um, if, if you really want to get it right for yourself, choose your parents carefully. Well, I try and make light of that a little bit. Uh, but the fact is, there are no perfect people on planet Earth. There's no perfect parents. You got who you got. Be thankful for the good that you got and be forgiving of what wasn't so good. And do the best you can to raise your children and raise them in the ways of God. And don't be too hard on yourself. People come to me all the time and they're worried they're not being a perfect parent. And I say, well, let me settle the issue for you. I agree with you. You're not being a perfect parent and you won't be and you can't be. So let's get that straight to begin with. And when I was uh, a young man, you know, especially in the 1980s, we were taught, you know, we're going to parent God's way. We're going to do everything God's way, which sounds really nice and is appropriate in, in some ways. But what it fails to recognize is I'm not perfect. And so I'm not going to be a perfect parent. And the thing is, in order to raise really, really, really good children, you have to be what's called a good enough parent. What does that mean? Essentially, it means this. A third of the time that we interact with our kids, we really should be resonating with their emotions, feeling what they're feeling, emotionally in tune. A third of the time with our kids, we might be a bit out of tune, but we're giving it our best shot. And a third of the time, we're really messing up. These are the times that we feel terrible for. I yelled at my kid. I didn't spend time with my kid. Um, I maybe was physical in an inappropriate way, you know, with my kid disciplining them. The things we feel terrible about. Parents come in and they're distraught. I say, what's the matter? And they say, well, I did this to my kid. I did this to my kid and I'm afraid I ruined my kid. And I say, um, do you do that more than a third of your interactions? And they said, no, I did it once or twice. And I say, well, relax then. 
um, is as long as you're only being that imperfect a third of the time and the other third of the time you're kind of reacting and relating appropriate to their emotions and the other third of the time you're you're really connecting emotionally you're going to raise a good kid again god built a lot of resiliency into your children because he knows you're not perfect and he built resiliency into you because he knows your parents aren't perfect. And I think that's important for us to understand so that we um, are a little bit more gentle with ourselves. And so Jesus at, at his baptism heard some very important words that we all needed to hear again and again and again. And I'm afraid many of us haven't heard. And that is the words of Daddy saying, you're my son, you're my daughter. I love you, and I'm pleased with you. Now, some of you did grow up hearing that, and you heard it consistently. And I'm glad for you, but I've got to tell you, you're in the minority. Most people didn't grow up hearing that kind of affirmation, but the heart longs for it. And when the heart longs for this identification from, from daddy saying, you're my little girl, you're my little boy, and I love you, and I'm proud of you. When the little heart doesn't receive enough of that, or even worse, there is abandonment. And sometimes nobody's at fault for the abandonment. There could be a death of a parent that causes abandonment. There could be divorce, which sadly causes uh, that, that feeling of abandonment. Or it could be that, you know, dad's just working, working, working to put food on the table. But the kid doesn't understand that. They just kind of feel abandoned. Or maybe the dad's out drinking and he's not out working hard and there's that abandonment. Maybe the dad leaves the family for another wife or another family. These things leave really, really deep wounds in the human heart. And those really need to be healed. We all need to hear you're my son, you're my daughter, I love you, and I'm pleased with you. When that doesn't happen, it makes it very difficult to accept that here's this God that I cannot see who's actually saying, Eric, I love you, and Eric, I'm pleased with you. A lot of times the, the pain in our heart um, towards God is because our mind makes an association between our earthly father and our heavenly father. And that can leave deep pains and deep disconnection between what we believe about God, as we sang earlier, you're a good, good father. And again, if growing up your daddy was really, really good to you, now he's not going to be perfect because he's human, right? Um, but if you grew up and daddy was quite attentive to you, it's pretty easy for you to sing and to mean and to experience when you sing to God, you're a good, good father. But for many of us, if there are areas of pain, and it doesn't mean we had a bad, 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 bad father. Um, sadly, some of you had that. Um, but none of us had a perfect father. And that impacts the way that we view and interact with our Heavenly Father. I want to give another example. Um, 
help me understand about what is the reason that God gives us a dad? Okay. So when I was a boy, and I think this is fairly universal, but I'm just going to apply it to myself. You know, when I was a boy, if I did something wrong, my first thought was, oh, no. Now dad's going to find out and I'm really going to be in trouble. How can I hide it from dad? And so maybe I simply wouldn't tell dad or maybe I would lie to dad because I thought if, if I have a problem, it's because I did something wrong. If I did something wrong, now dad is going to be angry and frustrated and disappointed and he's going to punish me in some way. It might be a verbal scolding. It might be, you know, losing a privilege, or it might be a physical punishment, right? Well, I want us to consider, is that the reason that God gave us a daddy? So that when we're in trouble, we can be more afraid and have bigger problems? Well, the answer is clearly no. Let me tell you why dad, or why God gave us a daddy, okay? Because, you know, my son Ian, and some of you remember Ian when we moved to uh, Vietnam, he was only a, one year old. Uh, Ian will turn 25 in October. Um, when Ian was a little boy, and I would always tell him, look, when, when you do something wrong, I need you to come and tell me. And the reason you come and tell me is not so that I can make things worse for you. But you've never been seven before I have. You've never been 14 before I have. You've never been 18. You've never been 24 before I have. And so... You know enough to get yourself into trouble as a seven-year-old, but you really don't know how to get out of it. You know enough to get into trouble at age 20, but you don't know how to get out of it. And so when you got trouble, come to daddy. And I'm going to say, well, first of all, you're probably feeling really guilty and really afraid and really ashamed. And that's the painful consequence of doing something wrong if we knew it was wrong. And so here's how we calm our heart when we're afraid or we're ashamed or we're embarrassed that we did something wrong. And, and then I help them to soothe this heart. And I say, now the next thing we have to do is figure out how can we make this situation right? How can we make this situation better? How can we make amends? And there may be consequences to that, but you'll feel so much better by doing the right thing. And so I tell my son, son, you know, one of the things I've learned is this. When you do something wrong, the worst thing you can do next is to lie about it. It's our first instinct because we're human. To lie is the gravitational pull of our humanity. But what I've learned is the worst thing you can do when you do something wrong is to lie about it or cover it up. It might seem like the right thing at the moment, but it's the worst thing. Best thing to do is to own it, to confess it, to admit it, to learn from it, and to make amends how can we fix that wrong thing that we did? And really, that's the reason God gives us a daddy. Again, you might say, you know, Eric, I just can't relate to that. It sounds like a fairy tale. It sounds like a Disney movie to me. I didn't grow up with that. And I understand that. Neither did I, really. But I've had to learn to reparent myself 
I've had to learn to be a good father to myself. The times that I feel sad and, and convicted and like a failure, instead of beating myself up, I have to say, Eric, it's okay. I'm going to help you get through this. Eric, I love you, even though you are perfectly imperfect. And Eric, I accept you. And Eric, I'm going to help you figure this out. And I'm essentially talking to myself the way that God is talking to me. So many of us carry deep, deep wounds because we didn't have these things spoken over our lives. I do remember um, one time with my dad, and I was just with my dad yesterday. Uh, Lop spent to my mom and dad's house in Woodburn, Oregon, and we were just down in Woodburn yesterday. Um, saw my mom and dad who are 85, uh, in good health, living on their own. Uh, I was down there. My wife, Jenny, was down there. My brother, Darren, was down there. And uh, so one of the things I remember, one of the most precious times of my dad, because I, I didn't get along very well with my dad from ages probably um, eight to 18, which are really important years, but they were the worst years for me with my dad. Um, but I remember one thing that, that really touched my heart during those years that I always keep in mind. Um, I was age 16 and I just learned to drive and I lived out in the country. And so in those days in the state of Oregon, not all of the country roads were paved. Now, if you come from places where the roads aren't paved, you're saying, well, so what? Of course they weren't, but, but you know, in the States, most roads are paved, but in, in those days, that was the 1970s, not all the country roads were paved. So I'd ask my dad if I could borrow his pickup truck to drive to the next town um, to do something. I think I was getting my hair cut. And I drove back and I remember driving down this long two mile road and I was feeling so grown up and so free and carefree um, and so in control of being able to drive the car or the pickup truck that I, I started driving this way and this way and this way, you know, back and forth across the road because there's nobody coming the other way. And then I realized I'm kind of acting irresponsibly. And so I was holding the, the wheel steady then. Problem is that the vehicle went into what we call a fishtail. The uh, momentum of the vehicle and the, you know, the force of gravity and the force of motion even though I stopped doing this, the truck didn't. And it kept going like this worse and worse. And I ended up in the ditch. Now, I was only going maybe 25 miles an hour because it's a, you know, it was a gravel road, maybe 30 miles an hour, but not very fast. And so I was not hurt. I was not injured. And the truck really wasn't hurt. Um, but I was so scared. I ran out to the main road and I started waving like this. And cars are stopping because they think, you know, somebody's dead or something. Somebody stopped. And I said, you know, I ran the car off the road and they went back with me. And they said, well, who's hurt? What's what's happening? I said, nobody's hurt. I was by myself. And uh, the guy looked at me. He goes, well, I think we can just push that out. He goes, jump in, start the truck. So I did. And he just pushed a little bit and I was out. And uh, so I thought it was the end of the world. I drove the next couple of miles home to the farm that we lived on, and I was so scared. My heart was pounding. I was scared because I'd just been in my first accident, and I thought, my dad is going to be so angry um, that I did this, and I didn't know what he was going to do. And so I parked the truck, and I walked back to the barn where my dad was feeding the animals. And I, I know I was shaking and I said, dad, I had an accident with the truck and I ran it off the road and somebody helped me push it back on the road. And my dad didn't say anything. He just walked over to the truck with me 
and he looked at it and then he looked at me and he said, that feels pretty scary, doesn't it? And I was shocked. And I, in my mind, I thought, oh my gosh, how does he know what I feel? That's exactly what I feel. And I was really comforted. He didn't hug me or anything. He also didn't yell at me or take away the car keys or anything. But the fact that he knew what I was feeling and empathized with me was absolutely huge to me. And a lot of the work that, that I do as, as a counselor really is empathizing with people, is listening to what they have to say and trying to put myself in their place and being able to help them know that they're not alone, that somebody understands what it's like to be them. So the, the summary really is this, that, you know, God is a father and he is, as we sang today, he is a good, good father. And part of our brain knows that and understands that and believes that. There's another part of our brain, the emotional part of the brain, which isn't so sure about that because as our emotional brain was developing very early in life, we probably didn't have those kinds of interactions with a father saying, you're my son, my daughter, I love you, I'm well pleased with you, um, I know you're perfectly imperfect and that's okay. The reason God gives you a daddy is so that when you're in trouble, I'm going to comfort you and then help you to do, um, you know, how, how to make the best decisions to make amends and resolve this. Most of us didn't grow up with that, okay? However, because of the way God made the brain, those old memories and those old neural pathways are still in our brain. And so when those come up today, I can still comfort myself and tell myself, Eric, I love you. You're okay. I know you made a mistake. I know you're trying to do your best. What can we learn from this? And how can we move on? If you don't have any example of what it means to have that kind of love or acceptance given to you by an earthly daddy, I want you to look at me. I love you. I accept you. And you're okay. I love you and I'm pleased with you just because you are you. And the love that I want to express to you is only a small, small part of the love that God has for you. So, those of us around the world that celebrate Father's Day. So on this Father's Day, I want to uh, congratulate and celebrate those of you who are fathers and remind you um, these are the best days of your life. Enjoy them. You don't have to be a perfect father. Um, be gentle with yourself. Spend time with your kids. And those of you, young or old, men, women, or children, um, be appreciative for the fact that your dad was only human. He wasn't perfect. The things he got right, be thankful for. The things he didn't get right, may God heal your heart and may you continue to reparent that hurt place in you. 
And with that, I conclude my message. And again, just want to thank you all for uh, allowing me to be with you today. Pastor Lop. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Eric. Thank you for a timely and wonderful message. And um, just want to say uh, to you as well uh, that we love you. Uh, as um, for me, as a, a both a, a, a friend, a good friend, a spiritual father, mentor, and um, we, uh, I mean the good thing is that we we know each other for so long. So I think we know yeah. all of our shortcoming and flaws. We do. Yeah. So that that is uh, the wonderful uh, to to uh, to hear this uh, comforting message from from the word of the Lord and to all of us. And I pray and I hope that the church. It's, um, you know, taking note, and I think we need to um, uh, reparent ourselves uh, because we all uh, didn't have the earthly uh, perfect uh, dad, but we do have a perfect heavenly father. So uh, so thank you uh, so much, uh, Pastor Eric Dooley, and I just want to do a, maybe a quick prayer for you and the family, and then so I will let you go. And so the church, we're going to have a, a time of reflection and some responses uh, to the, the message. Let us just uh, pray. Church, just enjoy our heart to pray for um, Dr. Eric Dooley and Pastor Eric Dooley. Thank you, Lord, uh, for uh, the message of, uh, of fatherhood. And Lord, you, you have demonstrated uh, throughout history and and. Uh, you uh, give us an example uh, throughout uh, many generations. Sometimes that Lord, we, uh, I think, did a hurtful thing to even believe in the lies of the devil, uh, lying about your attribute, your character, uh, your love. Um, Lord, we just pray that um, today, Lord, uh, each of us, those who have ear to hear, we can... Uh, decided, Lord, to reparent ourselves. Even we know for sh sure that our earthly parents, uh, they they uh, they are not perfect. But Lord, just want to pray for um, Pastor Eric Dooley, and as he working through the counseling, uh, that been his uh, counseling going to be a wisdom from on high, and continue to bring uh, healing to the process of of. Um, of uh, empathy, uh, of the process of understanding even self, and begin to um, to open up, allow your agape love, the love that on high that really bring healing to each individual who come to the door of the counseling office there with both uh, Jenny and Dooley, uh, Jenny Dooley and uh, Eric Dooley. Lord, we just pray for all the protection of the children. Lord, even though they're uh, they are being all uh, most of them that married and having kids also being a parents that they will uh, learn from dad uh, Eric as well and from be a, a, a approaching uh, that the parents that uh, at, with a acceptance a self acceptance in you Lord uh, that they are uh, perfectly imperfect and we thank you for the message this morning I want to pray a blessing over Pastor Eric Dooley and the family, the whole clan of the Dooley's family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you, uh, Eric, and I will see you later. Thank you so much. Send our love, regards to Jenny and all the children and the grandchildren. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you.